Welcome to the Archimedes stage, the home of network security and free software. So next up we have Carlos Rai Usendo, and he does M2M technologies and fireware project. And he'll be talking about V6 only scenarios and how Internet 6 ad adds value. So clap your hands for Carlos Rai Usendo. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, yeah. As she said, I'm Carlos Raleigh. Sometimes I'm known also as an IPv6 guy at Telefonica, right? I'm one of these boring guys that is every day, every year, saying we have to move, we have to go to IPv6. Before, I was in the network side of the company, and now I just moved to the services side, right? I believe that IPv6 is coming in the network domain. Years ago, I was working as a network researcher, and then we were just the researchers uh, thinking on IPv6. But later on, we started to talk to operations departments, and they started to consider seriously IPv6, and then they started to deploy. And now, in the operator I am in Telefonica, I'm proud to say that we have some deployments, right, like in Peru, as I will explain later. And then I decided at that time that now it's time to move on and move to the services side, because Still, many people consider IPv6 as a networking thing, a networking issue, but it's something that it also has an impact on the services, especially if we break uh, the rules today and we try to make the things differently. So how many of you guys have uh, some kind of IPv6 connectivity, like native or tunneled? Can you raise your hands up, please? So some of you, OK. Not too lucky then so far. OK, so my first ask to you guys is if you want to change the world, right? This is my son, Eric, right? He's cute, right? And um, he has a teaser with this message, I want to change the world. So then I was Googling what I can say to my son as an advice, how you can change the world, right? And what I found is a very nice sentence from the guy, very famous guy, right, Aldous Huxley. And he said that once he wanted to change the world, he found out that the most important is that what you can be sure about is to change yourself. And this is my message today, right? So if you want to change the world in the terms of using IPv6, the first thing is to change yourselves, right? Anyway, the world is moving, right? What is changing, we want or not. And silently, a, a new internet is, uh, is emerging. Many people think that, OK, IPv6 is something that they will configure in my router, in my host, right, to access the internet. And then the webs will be upgraded to, to be offered over IPv6 as well. And that's it, right? But the move, it's much bigger than that, right? Silently, we are building another logic internet. Right? The fact is that IPv4 and IPv6, as my colleague Miguel explained uh, some hours ago here in this stage, uh, are not compatible. That means that they behave like oil and water in the pipes. Right? They don't mix. Yes, we have transition mechanisms, but we are not talking about that. From the logical point of view, you have like two different internets. If I am in my host, I can access resources that are in IPv4, and they are not in IPv6, and vice versa. Most of the things that we are doing today is to put the things in both worlds, right? So we say, OK, something that was in B4 will be now in B6. But nothing prevents us to put things only in IPv6. This is what the people call 
a v6 only, right? The point is that the current IPv4 is what we know today, right? It's lacking addresses, right? And this is why we have to assign IP4 private addresses to many domains, right? It's complex because the, the way we have built the private domains, the NATs, etc., and it's basically based on the client server model. That means that many of the applications that we make have to be client server, they want it or not. And when somebody wants to deploy a peer-to-peer -peer service, like Skype, for instance, we all know Skype, then they have to deal with new protocols. They, got to go, they have to go to the standardization fora. They have to try to put all these protocols in the NATs, in the firewalls, to make this work. right? And this is not a nice thing, and it prevents a lot of innovation. On the other hand, we are starting to have another internet from the logical point of view that is huge because it has much more addresses. right? It's simpler because we can build it simpler. Of course, we can replicate with what we have in B4 and make it complex as well. But the, the point is that we should try to make the things differently. And natively, if we use it on the right way, we will have more end-to-end, -end, right? And this is something that I will try to explain a little bit. But OK, yeah, you want to do B6 only. But and you, you say that the world is changing. This is not actually my sentence. This is Internet Society that has set as one of the priorities for the Internet the move to IPv6. So if we want the Internet to survive, this is an important thing for Internet Society, right? And if we see how many connections uh, one uh, server like Google receives over v6, we can see that in the latest months, right, it's uh, increasing exponentially, right? It's still lower than 2%. But uh, in terms of what Internet Society is measuring, we say that we are starting to get close to the critical mass. Right? Uh, if we consider that any user that is accessing the Internet access Google at a certain point, I think we can say 100%, more or less, or nearly 100%, we can say that 1.75% of the hits to Google are over, over V6 already. On the contrary, OK, there are a lot of connections that are getting V6 ready, but what we are offering to them, not so much. OK, it's true that after the World IPv6 Day, what we have is something like 24% of the 500 Alexa ranking over V6. But this is the same stuff we are offering over V4, right? It was important to do this because then we have contents in the new network, right? But it's not enough. And uh, if we have a look to why this has happened. Of course, because perhaps it's very early in the stage of how IPv6 is deployed. I think there is a big misconception. And many people are starting to think this way. Point is that IPv6 normally is known just because before depletion, right? And for instance, in the operators, we were all the time thinking, OK, we will deploy v6 as long as we don't have v4 addresses to our customers, right? And this is the normal policy that we are all following. But a bigger misconception that I think it's one of the main stoppers to find new things over IPv6 is that the developers, and even many times the users, they are thinking that they will get the same, right? And this is where I see the opportunity that I will try to explain today, right? If you are a large uh, service provider, Right? I'm talking about somebody that has an application like Skype, and you have millions of v4 users. Of course, you have to look for backwards compatibility. Right? So in this case, you have the chains, what I call the chains of v4. Right? It's not bad. It's working. It's what you have. But if you deploy something in IPv6, you need to respect all the rules that you have been doing for v4 normally, because your service cannot offer something very differently to these users, because you have no way to differentiate. But if you are a startup, if you are an entrepreneur, or you are just some guy interested in developing something new, there is one option. I don't say you have to. I say it's an option that you can have that is to focus on IPv6 users, right? Free from the change of v4. Think on a real, truly, a truly peer-to-peer -peer network, right? And start to think how you will build the services this way. I will show you that you will not be the only ones, that there are many people and there are existing companies that are already taking this way, right? And I think this is important for people thinking on new businesses, because many times I find people that technically 
they are extremely good, and they come to me and they say, yeah, well, everything is done, there is every kind of application, but I say that is, there is a new market, right? There is a new potential market of customers that have IPv6, and they don't know how to exploit that. So, sometimes they don't even care. They, they are just regular users. The ISP came and say, OK, I give you native IPv6, and this is the future internet, but you will see in the future, right? We just gave that to you, and that's it. I would say that this is the main message of these slides. The paradigm shift is that you shouldn't copy and paste, right? If you are going to deploy, sorry, to develop and deploy V6 hubs, what you have to do is to think differently. Start from scratch, right? Draw yourself how is the new internet, right? Because we are coming back to the origins where every node can talk to every node, and you have firewalls, you don't have NATs, and this is much more easy to manage. And even some people are thinking to configure the firewalls at home in a different way, like the RFC of Swisscom with Cisco, that I will explain later as well. One thing that is important, I, IPv6 is something that we all know comes. As I will show later, there is more than 29 million users using v6 today, right? It's a still very low amount compared to the whole internet, but it's emerging market that you can target. And according to the rules of evolution, if you have a look to the Darwin theories, it's not the most clever, the nicest species, the ones that survive, but the ones that prevail are the ones that conquer and they adapt the best to the new environment. So let me go a little bit to the details to understand the change. What we have down is the current IPv4 internet. Sometimes we put just a cloud, and then I'm connected to the internet. This is quite funny. If uh, you look how the network uh, access here in the campus party is set up, you will laugh with me as well, because we are having some problems, and I think I can, I can talk a little bit about that later on another slide. But what we have is exactly that. People think I'm connected to the internet. False. Normally, you are connected to a private domain, and then there is an intermediate element that we all call NAT, right? Whatever it is, that connects at, us to the public internet. And it's the public internet, the one that has what we can call the internet abstraction, that is the real TCP IP where nodes can connect to each other, and they can look for services in the remote nodes. That is where end-to-end -end there is. How many servers do we, put in, do we put normally in private domains? I don't think anybody is offering servers behind NATs. But they come to you and, just, and they say to you, no, you can be behind a, behind a NAT, and then you can do everything what you want in the internet. False. That is not true, right? What we are doing is that we are starting to connect every single device to IPv6, right? So when my ISP, say, for instance, I don't know, at and in the US, for instance, that is deploying IPv6 or Telefonic in Peru, when they come to your home and in your ADSL, they give you native IPv6, actually, they are giving you two things. They are giving V6 addresses, but the most important, they are giving you the connectivity. The connectivity is the pipe that takes the V6 connection. And this is important. It's not that your computer has IPv6, it's that you have the two things. You have the addresses and you have the connectivity, right? And then you will be spreading this prefix, these IPv6 addresses, all over your network. And then what you will have is that all the devices are being connected to the other internet. As I said before, there are two internets. There is not one internet anymore. Don't think like that. And in this new internet, you are connected in the original way of the internet. You have a public address, right? And of course, you can firewall the addresses and build secure domains. But then you don't have to translate private addresses to public addresses or use ports to do these combinations that later make that you cannot accept incoming connections, for instance. right? So basically, what we are doing uh, in a nutshell is to rewire the whole internet. right? We are connecting everything to the new internet, but we are rewiring everything. And this means that what we are doing is bringing back innovation at the first plane. Now I'm sit uh, behind a NAT, and they say, you have internet, like here in the campus party. OK, I say to my colleagues that I, they are participating in the firewall challenge of the IoT challenge that it has 10K uh, euros price. And then they have Raspberry Pis. They connect to our platform. But when the platform wants to send a command to the Raspberry Pi, they, have, they don't have a way to do that. 
Why? Because they are behind an ad. And when I go to the network guys here, I've been 24 hours discussing with them, and they say, it's a risk for our network to change that configuration. So that's not internet. That's browsing, right? So we don't confuse what is to be able to browse the internet than um, compared to be connected to the internet, right? And I would challenge these guys to put a server behind an ad. And let's see if they say that you can do everything. So when you rewire the internet, which are the things that start to happen that make me think that we can do the things differently? And this is why I will ask you today to start to build these six applications and collaborate with me, right? Very simple change, right, that everybody would uh, infer very easily is that when I am at home and I have IP before, I just have one IP public address, then I have the NAT, and then all my devices are there. They are all mixed in a private network, and they all take this NAT to go. So the only security port that I have is the NAT. And then my question is, OK, now I have an air conditioner that is connected with a Wi-Fi. It can talk to the, the vendor of the air conditioner. Why this air conditioner has to be in the same network and have the same security policies as the tablet that I'm using to browse the internet or go to my bank? And moreover, maybe I have a peer-to-peer -peer server to exchange legal content, of course. But uh, it has to accept incoming connections. And it, it is on the same network of my tablet that I use for the bank. Hmm, nice, crazy, right? So why not to have different IP subnets, public subnets, where I just have different rules for every network? And then my tablets are in one network, my peer-to-peer -peer servers or clients are in another network, and my air conditioner is in the home automation network, right? This is the right way to do the things. This is not something that I invented myself. Cisco, Ericsson, Nominum, and others are working in a working group in the IDF, right, that is called HomeNet, right? I had the opportunity to be the head of delegation for Telefonica in the IDF, and then I know these guys, and uh, this is a, an, an opportunity, right? It's a very simple thing, but it will change the way we can do applications as well, because we will be able to select different prefixes to do different things. Right? Maybe you don't want a device to be in one network or the other, but you want a device to be in the two networks and select the prefix according to what you're going to do. This is something that today is uh, something simply impossible. When we can number all the devices with public IP addresses, they say, no, no, this is not secure. Come on. If we would have listened to the security people the first day of the internet, we would not have internet because the only secure host is switch off and down the ocean, right? So the first thing, we have to search for functionality. And we have to listen to the security guys carefully, because they are normally right. And we will protect the network the way they say. And of course, they will fail. They will attack a network. And later, they will correct, because this is a learning process, right? So what I have in the campus party, yeah, all my outgoing traffic can go, but of course, if I want the red lines to happen, I have to say to my colleagues working in the challenge, I have to wait for these network people to configure that. And they think that it is unstable enough to reconfigure that it can drop all the traffic network. Right? Awesome. If they would have IPv6 here with public IPv6 addresses, they would just reconfigure a firewall that is something that never throws any network mainly because you can also set the firewall in another, in another machine, while the NAT has to be in a, the same in the, in, a, in, the, in the VLAN. So in the corporations, we are always, always talking about outgoing traffic. And when we talk about companies, it's even worse than in the campus party. We can only go to access web traffic, right? Or sometimes three, four ports, SSH, web, secure web, and two things more. But if I have a server at home, like in my case, a home automation server that is listening, say, in the 8888, then I cannot access that because the policy of my company is that. The policies of the corporate networks would be much more flexible if we would have public addressing in the devices, even in the, even in the let's say, the workstations of the workers, and uh, we would just filter. If you believe that I'm crazy, we did that experience in Telefonica R&D. We have 
telephonic R&D premises in the city of Zaragoza in Spain and in the city of uh, Valladolid in Spain with some 100 uh, workstations and we decided to migrate everything to public IPv6 with filtering. And it works perfectly. All the workers are browsing Google, Geotube, and uh, Facebook with the IPv6. Many of them, they didn't even notice, and it's working perfectly. Another thing that is going to change is uh, the story of the peer-to-peer. -peer. Have you ever wondered how Skype works? There are some internal documents of Skype that are available out there, and it's a very funny story. Perhaps you know how Skype was originated. These were some Estonian guys, some Estonian coders, with some funding from Sweden and from Denmark. I know this story very well because my wife is from Estonia, so these people are very famous there. And uh, these guys were the same ones that made the Kaza peer-to-peer application, right? When they were developing Kaza, they develop an infrastructure of super nodes, servers, etc., to be able to do peer-to-peer. -peer. So when they decided to go for a voice over IP application, they saw that the, all the others, they were using central servers to do voice over IP. Total stupid thing, because personal communications is natively peer-to-peer. -peer. So Skype guys said, we will do the same architecture as Kaza, but for voice over IP. And this is what they did, OK? They are reusing a lot of things from Kaza, but of course, with a lot of evolution. But if I'm in a network at home, I have my NAT, how Skype is able to establish a connection with my colleague that is, in turn, behind another NAT? How that is possible? Like here, I cannot accept incoming connections. Well, this is because Skype standardized a method. They went to the IDF, and they standardized a technique that is called UDP punching hole, and TCP punching hole, right? And some methods to help this. With this, I will not talk the, about the whole algorithm. I have a paper with one colleague of security, right? But basically, you say to Skype servers, I want to talk with my colleague. I don't know where he is, right? Then Skype knows where your colleague is because your colleague is registered into the network, right? And then they run some processes to discover where you are and uh, which is the configuration of your network. And then Skype says, OK, these guys are behind a NAT. Also, they are clever enough with these Stone algorithms that they are also standardized in the IDF. They discover which kind of NAT you have, right? Because not all the NATs are the same. They can be symmetric, asymmetric. They can support uh, mapping through, uh, with ports, etc. So let's say that this algorithm is clever enough to discover the kind of, uh, of NAT you are behind. And the Skype servers, they establish a connection with a client B, with a client A from their central server, right, or one, from one super node. And later, there is a software in 80% of the NATs that we use in the internet that when you establish the reverse connection, the NAT says, OK, when I get the connection from, from B through the server S, and, I, and, he, and A is establishing the same connection to B, that is kind of the same connection, right? It's a little bit more complex, and it depends on the type of NAT, but let me simplify like that. And then, basically, what the software do that does is to open a hole in the NAT. So nice. Everybody says, yeah, with NATs, we have security. And now what we have is something that opens a hole in the NAT where A is behind and the NAT where B is behind. So do you think that it's only a Skype or the peer-to-peer software, the one that is able to know where the hole is and then use it? False. Exactly. The paper that my colleague of security is writing is how to exploit this thing when this happens to access your computer. And this brings one paradigm that I've been discussing with Fernando Gont that maybe some of you know. It's a very well-known security expert in the field of IPv6. He's from Argentina. And we were discussing in some, uh, in some event some months ago. And uh, basically, he starts to agree that the, the way we are building the networks are extremely closed. We close everything. The network has to work always. Everything is protected. But later, the application guys come, and they start to standardize things to make holes in the firewalls right, and to work. And moreover, 
if you know the WebRTC standard and you Google WebRTC architecture, you will see that in the architecture there is a box that is called something like name, something like communication, where you can see the UDP punching hole techniques. So what this people are bringing is the peer-to-peer -to, -peer to the navigators. And they say, this is going to be a revolution because the people will be able to develop video conference applications in the browser. And there are many browsers that are actually supporting this today, right? So this means that we are bringing all these holes to the application layer, right? This is inefficient, inefficient and at the same time, it's dangerous. So what we are starting to think is that maybe the networks should be a little bit more open because they are going to open this at the application layer anyway. And at the same time, um, it's the way the network should behave. Just going to another different thing in the Internet 6 is that we can enable new protocols and we can bring new devices. I don't know if you had the opportunity to, to see, well, thanks to the, the way electronics and all these things are advancing, you have like these modes, like this one up there, that has, hosts basically uh, a TCP IP stack, right? Uh, I mean, a TCP IPv6 stack in this case. And they are able to offer like a web service directly from the sensor, right? Well, if you are using devices that uh, are going to be connected to the internet, why not to assign them a public address? This is obviously only possible with the uh, number of addresses that IPv6 gives to us. But moreover, in IPv4, there is the traditional way not to use so much UDP. When you ask a sensor about information, the sensors are normally battery operated. And what you want is to send as uh, less information to them and back as possible, to consume less battery, to be quicker, also because the packets can be lost in these mess radio protocols. And then what the IDF has done is they have created the REST standard that normally we use for HTTP and uses TCP. They have created the REST over UDP. This is called co-op, right? Has been standardized, it's becoming an REF. I think it became an, uh, an RFC already. And there are many devices that are going to implement this. Anyone can buy this over the internet. There are a lot of startups that are building these devices. I, I didn't need to go far. There were two companies in Madrid City and one in Barcelona developing these devices, right? There is the Contiki OS and the Tiny OS operating system that supports IPv6. You download this, you flash this to these devices, and then these devices talk IPv6, talk UDP, and talk co-op as well, right? So basically, the device becomes part of the internet. You have heard a lot about the internet of things, but this is funny. They say the things are connected to the internet, and this is false normally. For instance, if we use protocols like Zigbee, SayWave, there is a radio protocol towards the platform, and the platform connects uh, the devices to the internet. So they are not really connected. If you want devices connected, they have to be part of the internet and serve the information. That doesn't mean that you have to access always the sensors. You can access the platform. But also, you can disintermediate the platform when you need it. Right? You can access the, you can, uh, get the authentication from the platform and later access directly the device. If you believe I'm crazy, there is one company that is producing these bulbs that have uh, the six low pan and the co-op already there, so you can access right from a six low pan network. And one thing of the six low pan is that you need a gateway six low pan to I, to regular IPv6 because basically it compress some headers, but it's just a routing. It's not a let's say application layer translation, so it works pretty fine. And uh, there are some companies like Vibrant Solutions that is building, that is deploying, sorry, these uh, kind of modes with IPv6 and COP for the public lighting in some places. And there is SensiNode. Perhaps you know this because of the news, because uh, the company ARM has bought this for by millions of euros last week, right, to make a, the solution of Internet of Things. This was a Finnish company. They were the leaders of Co-op and Six Low Pan, and they were the ones pushing in the IDF for that. So this is one of the things that you can do also differently with IPv6. And then you say, come on, Carlos. OK, you say, as an entrepreneur, I can deploy applications, V6 only, to people that have IPv6. But 
you made a question, how many of us have IPv6? Not so many, right? Let me show you the figures, right? Google is offering us how many hits per country there are on IPv6. And uh, in my blog, what I did is use the OECD statistics of internet penetration per country to calculate more or less how many people we are talking about. You would say, maybe the algorithm is not OK. Don't worry. I checked this with some guys from Google and from Cisco, and we all agree on this, right? Some number up, down, this is more or less OK. So when we see the numbers, we see that in the US, there are 10 million different uh, IPv6 connections to the internet. 10 million starts to be a figure to consider when you are thinking on a product, right? I don't have every day 10 million target customers that others are not targeting for an application. I don't know what's your case. Then we follow with Japan, 3.5 million, France, 2.7. Germany is growing extremely fast because they are making a huge deployment. Then China figures, I would, pay, I would put <laughs> with uh, quotations because I'm not so sure. Romania, the second ISP there made a huge effort, and they went to a very high number as well. Switzerland has made this practically from zero in just uh, six months. And then we have the case of Peru in the end that this is the deployment of Telefonica in Latin America. And just, just to let you know how fast the things can go, I, I received one call one day from the guys that manage the international network of Telefonica. This is a company called Telefonica International Wholesale Services. And they say, Carlos, look, in one of the pings with Google, we saw a rise of our traffic in a number of 100 times from one day to the other. You know what is going on. And then I checked, and the people from Peru were starting to deploy massively to the ADSLs there, right? So practically from zero, Peru became like the 11th network sending IPv6 traffic to Google, right? And my network guys in the international network were totally amazed, right? And they needed to trace the traffic to know what is going on. This is also a lesson. Many people in the networks are saying, traffic is low, I don't care. But what my, the message is that it can grow fast. Because when you give this to the users, the browsers, they start to navigate with v6, and you don't, you don't notice. I have the same figures for different countries. And uh, you can see here the numbers, right? But perhaps I think these graphics are more interesting. You cannot see them very well. But you have the URL there to make these graphics yourself. You can compare countries with other countries. And this is not made, made by me. This is made by Eric Minke from Cisco, right? And um, you can see how the trend is in the US there, up on the left. Canada is there in red as well, not doing anything, really. You can see how the growth of Peru is. This graphic is not updated. Now is there is a 2, but now it's 3 dot something, right? So it's growing faster. Here you have Europe, and this blue line that goes up suddenly is Switzerland. So you can see really how, how fast it can go when an operator says, I go on right with this. And here we have uh, basically the Asia Pacific right, with Japan, China, Australia, and India. Right? As I say, with a URL like this one, you put the countries, and you get the comparison. This is some very nice work that Eric made for all the community. OK, so my message. We can do the things differently. I say try to do the things differently. And there start to be a lot of people with native IPv6 that you can target, and you're free from the chains of v4. But OK, you're not an expert, perhaps. I'm sure many of the people here are more than I am. But anyway, let, let me go for a try. How we can get started, right? My suggestion is take some hardware that is a cheap one, like the Raspberry Pi, right? You know, it's $35, but when you get everything with a case, with a cable, with, like the Raspberry Pis that we've been given here in the fiveware, these are, these are 10 minutes only, OK. These, <laughs> these are uh, 60 euros in the end, right? But it's still cheap. And this is a server that you will have permanently connected in your home. So some years ago, with my colleague Antonio, we had the opportunity to meet Binserf that has been here also. He's considered the father of the internet. We made a demo to him about IPv6. And uh, he's very inspiring. And 
sometime later, we have decided to go on with the idea. So we have set up a kind of personal project, right? That is a hub to collaborate on IPv6 applications, right? So I'm not just giving you here a dry message that you should do this, but I'm doing this myself, and I'm gathering collaborators to do this. So anyone interested to develop IPv6 applications, you can come to me, you can register here, and let's do it together, right? We have some ideas. You don't have to think yourself. And we will provide some sort of open source libraries so you can build on top of that, right? The libraries are open source, but later with your software, you can sell it, you can close it, you can do whatever you want. You are totally free, right? And uh, this is the URL, by the way. It's presented today. So I've not been presenting this before. I think we finished the first version like yesterday, 4 AM. So I hope there are not so many mistakes. And there are some inspiring videos. If you go to the section, collaborate, join, then you arrive to a Fusion Forge. Sorry, guys, we are not an experts on that. We, we also can get some help on that, if you are interested. So what kind of things we are doing in this Internet 6, Internet 6 hub? The first project was to look for a server in the Internet in a cloud that give us V4 and V6. We, we found this VR, VR.org. Right? So we have a server in the cloud. And we plan to use this not only for the web, the wiki, and the forts, but also if we need some kind of registry for users, for some peer-to-peer -peer services, we can use that. Right? So we have a server that we pay, and it's offered to the community that wants to join. Right? And then we have the Fusion Forts with the first projects that we are starting to, to set up. There is a tutorial that I have to upload tonight right? to write C code. That is uh, IPv6 approved. And here, there is the section that says how to translate your v4 existing code into v6. It's just very simple. You follow these steps. And uh, I'm not the best programmer here, but I can help you, because I've been doing this myself with some code. The main project of the hub is what we call i6 station. Our project is to put all these libraries in a box, and that every guy that gets IPv6 at home, we say, come on, you put this for 60 euros, and you will be able to try all the Internet 6 stuff. OK, now you cannot try so many things, so we will just target the geeks. You know? But believe me, after 10 years working in IPv6, I know many people interested in this. Right? And then for the users, sorry, for the developers, it's different. The features that we offer to them is a platform with the libraries, with the co-op servers, all these things, to start to develop services. right? The first thing that we are offering with the i6 station is very simple. Uh, to the user, we, we measure and compare the Internet 6 connectivity, right? And we start to manage the prefixes in the network that they are given. In my ADSL of Telefonica at home in Madrid, I have uh, IPv6 native, right? And uh, Telefonica is giving me a slash 56. Well, I'm giving myself a slash 56, let's say. This, this means that I have totally uh, something like 256 slash 64 networks, right? That they are all public addressing for me, right? And uh, I'm just using one today. But I want my Pi to make the DHCP for my network, DHCP v6, of course, to organize different domains so my devices can be in different IP domains and I start to play with that. Then over the i6 station, thank you you can have different modules. These are just ideas. I'm not working on that. We are just looking for collaborators that I, they are interested. The first one would be to create these security realms that we were discussing before. That is something that you can do differently. And I've been discussing this guy that was before in the talk at uh, 4. This was the guy, Mark Tonsley, from Cisco. He wrote the RFC that he, <laughs> you were discussing with him. And uh, Mark is working in the home net working group at the IDF. So he recommended me that we try to follow in the pie the, the things that they are doing in the IDF. So we want to gather collaborators to read these standards and to try to implement this for the routers that won't be Cisco that you will have at home so you can organize your prefixes. The second is to set co-op services at home. So when we access services at home, we can put UDP servers at much lighter, and they have one security advantage compared to TCP. If you have a TCP server, a port scan will always report there is something there. And then the hacker just needs to go on, go on, because they know there is something open there, because the three-way three, three handshake of TCP. But if you put a silent UDP socket, 
The hacker will never know with the port scan that there is something there. They see that port like the other ports. And then it's much more difficult to find your services. And in the end, this is much more secure, and of course, much secure than trusting the NAT only for security. The third module, this is, of course, only an idea, is that we all use WhatsApp and all these kinds of personal communications software. Some people are worried that all your messages are going through third-party servers, right? And they're getting all your data. Maybe we could set up in the i6 station some server that you can use to talk with a truly peer-to-peer -peer network. And then these messages are not traversing any network. They cannot make any big data with you. They cannot store your pictures, et cetera. And finally, the idea, the final project, is to, to go for a real six low pan network. I'm talking with the company that provided me these modes, right? Because I'm not a hardware guy, but if there are people interested in hardware, we could consider. And I ask them, how many? Uh, devices, I have to ask to you that you will provide me something nice like the Safeway sensors that we are giving here, like these present sensors. Nice, something that you can use commercially. And um, I was quite surprised when they said to me that with an order like 50K, they could produce this for me. 50K is nothing, right? So we are very close to get real devices, commercial like devices to use using six low pan standard. And these are using V6 addresses when you have the V6 prefixes at home, et cetera. And that's it, right? This is, this is all. We are setting up this Internet 6 hub to collaborate. We want people to make IPv6 applications. You have millions of users that are starting to have IPv6, and they don't know how they will take profit of that, right? There are companies that are starting to work with V6, like SensiNode, and they are bought. Right? So there is an opportunity. I know many others, many other initiatives that are starting to work with V6 only, and they are under the radar of the investors. So if you think that you will deploy your V6 application for a startup or a starting business, when everybody is on V6, you will be late. Right? The time to start is now. Millions of users, you can test, but still, it's not mainstream. Right? And this is all. If you want to cooperate, just let me go back. Ah, oh, sorry. Let me go back here. And just follow this and join the join the collaboration. I've been requested to make this presentation also to Internet Society in Spain. The Internet Society CTO in Washington DC at the world level also they are very interested in this work. But we want to start slow, right? We want the developers to join and let's see what we can do all together. Right? Thank you very much. OK, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> if not, I will start to ask you, because there are not so many people. And uh, I've been suffering here, so. <laughs> I want to throw the first. <laughs> um, what happens if the companies like Telefonica don't provide users IPv6? Okay, very, very good question. Well, as I have shown, this is changing, right? In the case of Telefonica, that um, we have started this massive deployment in Peru, and we are not doing this just there. I know there is an undergo deployment also for the mobile networks and some ADSL networks in different countries, right? We've been doing also in the Czech Republic, right? Although I've not been putting that in the figures. And um, the point is, with the i6 station project, one of the things that we offer to the developers, because of course it would be very difficult to match that the developers are also the ones that have been selected by operators to have IPv6. So one of the things that i6 station gives to you is a tunnel, right? A V6 over V4 tunnel just to test. But this is only for the developers. For the users, it only works when you have V6 native connectivity. So the first thing is that when you are a developer, you want to anticipate the market. So you still don't have V6 at home, then get the i6 station, get the tunnel, and start to work. Because anyway, you can do tests with others, right? As long as you get the V6 prefixes and you get the V6 connectivity to others. It's not the way we want the things to work, but you can try your developments that way. And then the point is, uh, if we are seeing 
The graphics that I saw before. Mm -hmm. ah, where they were? Ah, here. You can see how the things grow when they turn on. And um, when Deutsche Telekom is massively deploying in Germany, when Telefonica is massively deploying in South America, and especially with, when AT&T, Verizon, Time Warner Cable, and others are massively deploying in the US, everybody's to follow. So of course you can wait, but then it will be late. That is the message. Any more questions? Somebody wants to join? Raise your hand. Somebody that wants to develop? Oh, jump people, they are always fresh. Very good. Ah, uh, they can say something. Say, I want to join. <laughs> OK, it's done. Thank you very much, Carlos. OK, thank you very much talk. for your patience. Thank you. Round of applause. And at 9 o'clock, we'll have Simon Phipps on open source and the new society.